Good morning, Epworth Church. It is good to gather together again as we worship remotely. But we do have some good news. Next Sunday, May 31st, we will be having our regular remote worship as planned. But we will also be offering drive-in opportunities for worship on Pentecost Sunday, which is for us a great day in the life of the church, but a sad day in a way in the life of Epworth because it's Bill Jones' farewell send-off. He will be preaching. We're going to have two worship opportunities, one at 8 a.m. and the other at 10.30 a.m. Watch your e-blast for details. Because these are drive-in services, we'll make you stay in your car and we'll have some particulars that you'll need to follow for that like who can come at 8 and who has to come at 10.30. So please be patient and help work with us as we try our best to make sure that everyone has a chance to greet Bill. Some people have said we can see you all better watching on the computer. This is true, but we can't see you. We want a chance for everyone to be able to see Bill. Since it's Pentecost, we want you to dress in red and swag your car out in red and just have a good time. So look for details on that. The following week on June 7th, we'll again be offering at 8 and 10.30 two drive-in worship opportunities, and for those, we will be honoring our 2020 graduates from Epworth Church. So watch your e-blast for details about that. Just a word about the church closure and our plans for reopening. We have established a task force for plans to reopen for worship inside the building. It's not going to be the same as it was, at least for a while. We're going to require masks. We're going to require safe distancing. We don't have everything we need in place yet, so we can't tell you exactly when that will begin. It will begin in accordance with both the county executive of Baltimore County and Governor Hogan's plans, but we may not be ready when they are. So be patient with us, because our job is to keep you safe. The word pastor is actually the same as the word shepherd, which means the one who is there to help and support and guide and keep you safe. Often in the times of our Lord Jesus Christ, what a shepherd did was not just to watch over the sheep, but to prepare a pasture for the sheep. That meant going in and removing any things that might hurt the sheep, rocks that could fall and hurt one of the lambs, or plants that were poisonous, or scorpions and snakes. They had to clear the area. We're going to prepare this sanctuary to make it safe for you and the building as safe as we can be. Right now we're having trouble procuring all the safety equipment and sanitation things that we need, but we will get there, so be patient, pray. We don't need the building to be the church, we are the body of Christ and nothing will prevail against us. But until we can worship together in one place, we will continue to worship safely from a distance. So thank you for your patience and your cooperation. Now let us begin to worship and praise God together this morning. Good morning, everyone. Please join me in the call to worship. You have heard what was written about Jesus in scripture, how he would suffer and die and then rise from the dead on the third day, how the same power that raised Jesus from the dead raised him to heaven and seated him at the right hand of God, where he now lives to intercede on our behalf. So let us come before God with confidence through the loving intercession of our risen Lord. Now please join us in our hymn of praise, Hail the Day That Sees Him Rise.
Wesley, and if you couldn't figure it out, it is about the ascension of our Lord, which happened 40 days after Easter, preceding the 50 days after Easter, that great 50 days that culminates in Pentecost. <coughs> we weren't going to gather here during the week to celebrate that, so today we are going to look at the ascension of Jesus and what it means for the church still today. And I have been waiting for this one, so take it away, Miss Debbie, with our children's sermon for this morning. Hi, everyone. It's Miss Debbie. Happy Memorial Day weekend. We finally got to the holiday, and normally we would be at the beach, I guess, and I hope some of you are going to get out and have some fun and make some s'mores. But this is also the weekend that we say thank you to all the men and women who have served our country. The Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, the Coast Guard, the National Guard. Shout if you have been a service member or one of your family members has been a service member. Yeah, I hear Coast Guard, I hear Army, I hear Navy. Thank you all for your gift of love, for your gift of service to us and our country. We are going to tell the story today of the last day of Jesus on earth at, at the top of a mountain. Let's get started. The disciples had gathered on the Mount of Olives, just outside Jerusalem. As they ate together, Jesus told them firmly, Don't leave Jerusalem. Wait there for what the Father promised, the promise you heard from me. John baptized in water, but you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. One of the disciples asked Jesus, Master, are you going to restore God's kingdom to Israel now? Is this the time? You won't know when the time comes for God's kingdom to come. That timing is the Father's business. But what you will get is the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be able to be my witnesses to tell the good news of life forever with God in his kingdom. Tell the news in Jerusalem, all over Judea and Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. These believers were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. I pray for them. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their messages, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. As the disciples watched, Jesus was taken up, up, up and disappeared in a cloud. They stood there staring into the empty sky. Suddenly, two men in white appeared. They asked, why do you just stand here looking up at an empty sky? Jesus, who was taken up from among you to heaven, will come back as certainly and as mysteriously as he left. So the disciples left the mountain and returned to Jerusalem, about a half a mile away. They went to the upper room they had been using as a meeting place. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James, even the women, even Jesus' mother, Mary, agreed that they would stay together for good, completely together, in prayer. All right, we're going to do this. Yeah, we're, we're together forever. That's it. We're doing it. Amen. That was that was pretty amazing watching Jesus go up into the sky. While he was here, Jesus talked so much about the kingdom of God. 
and he taught he even taught the, us the prayer the Lord's Prayer that talks about the kingdom of God thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven it was very important that we got that message I also love that Jesus prayed for the disciples that he asked God to take care of them and protect them and that's why we have the Holy Spirit that's why the Holy Spirit came to protect them and give them the power to spread the good news of this life, this eternal life that we can have. And now it's up to us to use that Holy Spirit to spread the news. How about if we say a prayer? All right, everybody, hold your hand. It's okay. Holy God, you shared your love for us by sending us Jesus and he spent his life demonstrating that love and teaching his disciples to carry on the message of your love and the good news that we can live in that love forever. We don't know when Jesus will return to bring your kingdom here to earth, but we can continue what the disciples started, to share the stories and tell the good news of your love and gift of life forever for believers. Protect us and give us your peace and love. All these things we pray in your name. Amen. Have a great, great weekend. And we'll see you next time. That There's something special happening next week, too. Have a good time this weekend. And get some s'mores. Okay? All right. See you next time.
amen, Elaine. And indeed, God does have plans for us. And we're about to hear about some of those plans in our lesson from the New Testament, from the book of Acts, the story of the Ascension. But first, we must reveal today's mystery liturgist. And who is it this morning? It is Christina Sheridan. Hey, Christina, I am so happy to see you. I have enjoyed Hi, your posts on Facebook about the challenges of working from home while homeschooling and uh, herding cats. So how have you all been and faring during this time of social isolation? It has been interesting, to say the least. Um, a little tough, but we're, we're making it through day by day. Amen. Well, we look forward to seeing you back here with us soon. But until then, Can't Christina wait. is bringing us our first lesson this morning. Hi, everybody. So this morning we're reading from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 6 through 14. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Thank you so much. We continue with the gospel lesson, again coming from the time before Jesus' crucifixion, this time from the 17th chapter of John's gospel. This is Jesus' prayer to his Father for his disciples, those who were gathered around him that time and those who would follow, including us. And unlike the other gospels where Jesus prays while the disciples fall asleep, they are listening to his words. They know what he is asking God on their behalf. And so we begin reading at the beginning of chapter 17, the first 11 verses. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They are yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you, for the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to let you know another little pastoral secret. Weddings are a lot harder to do than funerals. Funerals, you don't usually have a thousand questions or a thousand opinions or mothers of the bride. You don't generally have the mother of the person being remembered. But I know that every time I gather with a couple wanting to get married, 
when I tell them that the United Methodist Church requires of deacons and elders who perform weddings, of local pastors, all of us, we are only to do a wedding after due counsel. And so they come into my office and they sit down and they want to talk about one thing and one thing only. They want to plan that worship service. And more than once, I've had the same kind of eh, discussion, let's call it, if not a knockdown, drag out fight with a bride who says, what do you mean I don't get to say I do? What do you mean I have to say I will? I want to say I do. I ask him the same question every time. Why do you want to say I do instead of I will? I get the same answer most times because that's how it's done in the movies. Little girls dream their whole lives about saying those words, I do. But in the United Methodist worship service of marriage, and it is a worship service, where the celebrants are the bride and groom and the pastors are only the witnesses for the state and for the church. They're the ones who make their vows to each other. And there is a big difference between I do and I will. I do is talking about what you do right this moment. I will is a verb of the future. It's a transitive verb. I was an English major, and so I do get hung up on meanings and particular meanings of words. But I will implies future. It's something that you are determined to live out. It's easy to look at the boy when he comes there, when she's coming down the aisle to him in all her radiance and beauty, and he is standing there in a tuxedo with his hair combed and his face shaved, looking better than he ever will again. He's even gone past the prom at this point in terms of how good he cleans up. When she looks at him then, it's easy to say, oh, yes, I do. But I'm telling you a little bit of secret. If you've been married, you know that we all don't look as pretty as we did the day we got married every day of our marriage. He's never going to look this good again. He's never going to smell this good again. She is never going to be all this dialed up again. And that is when marriage really happens. And so brides and grooms are a little frustrated when I tell them at the beginning of the premarital counseling period, I care a lot more about your marriage than I do about your wedding. I promise your wedding will be beautiful. It will be as flawless as we can possibly make it. But I care more about your marriage because the wedding is not the culmination of all that has come before. This is not Prince Charming kissing the fairy princess and they lived happily ever after. This is what connotes the beginning of a new relationship, a relationship unlike any that anyone has ever had before. Two people committing their lives to each other, moving forward in God's name into an unknown future together. There's some aspects of this in the stories that Christina read and the one that I read from the Gospel because we are coming to the time of the ascension. Jesus is leaving the disciples. He is taken up out of their sight into the clouds. And they watch him go, and they stand there staring into the sky. And I would have done the same thing. I would have been just like the cowardly lion and the scarecrow and the tin man when the wizard took off going, come back, because they don't know how in the world they're going to do anything without Jesus. They think he's gone out of their sight, and so they stand there staring into the clouds until two angels have to appear to them and say, get your head out of the clouds. It is time for you to be the church. This comes right before the Pentecost, but in John, Jesus has already breathed the Holy Spirit into them. They just don't know yet what it's going to accomplish through them. It is a lot like a wedding, isn't it? It's the beginning of something new. And if you look back to what we said in John's Gospel, what does Jesus say? Father, the hour has come. Now, if you study John's Gospel or you remember the stories from the beginning, early on, the first miracle in John is not called a miracle, but a sign of who Christ is for these people. It is the wedding at Cana of Galilee. His mother comes to him because they've run out of wine. And what does he say to her? Woman, my hour has not yet come. And even though he says that to her, she tells the servants to do what he says. We know the rest of the story. He turns water into wine, and they're amazed at the abundance and the grace that he shows at that moment. But now he's saying the time has come, the time to be glorified. And we have to look at what glorification means. It's not just exaltation. It's not just praise. It's not about falling down and worshiping. It's about getting up and serving, because what Jesus is saying to the Father is, you have glorified me, and I have glorified you which means very basically, I have made you known to your people. I have made you known through the signs, through the miracles, through the works. I've made you known through the power. And now it is time. 
And he doesn't say to the disciples, do you believe this or do you intend to do this? He says, you will be my witnesses. You will be clothed from power on high. Jesus doesn't say to them, you have within you the potential to become my witnesses. Jesus does not say to them, wouldn't it be nice if you all decided that you would witness to me? Jesus says to them what is absolutely the truth. You will be my witnesses. You will be clothed with power and you will witness to me. You will make me known. You will glorify me by revealing me here in Judea. You will go to Samaria. And remember, that was not a place they wanted to go. It was across a different culture and to a people that they had been taught that they could hate and despise and avoid. Jesus says, you're going to be my witnesses there. You're going to tell them about my power because my power is going to live in and through you. And then Jesus says, and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Trust me, Cockeysville, Maryland is the end of the earth from first century Palestine. And even though Timonium is actually a Greek word that comes from Timon of Athens, they didn't dream that there would be a suburban Baltimore or a Maryland or United States of America. They didn't even necessarily know that there was a continent on this side of the world at that point. But because they allowed that spirit to work in and through them, because they allowed that spirit to fill them, to take away their fear, to send them into the world, we are here today because their witness was so profound. And we are continually called to continual witness to the power of Jesus Christ. That is how we make him known and that is how we glorify him. There's been a lot of discussion about opening churches right now and some people are pushing us to do that. Some people are afraid that the church will not continue if we close for much longer, that people will stop giving their offerings. Let me tell you what has happened with the Margareta Griffith Scholarship Fund. We have had the biggest gift given to date for this scholarship fund. We're going to be able to send our students out with money that will substantially help them to buy books or other things that they need for their education because of the faithfulness of this congregation. I told you last week we have people making masks and we have more people doing more things in the community through their giving but also through their witness. We have folks who take time every week to call someone up to offer encouragement and hope. That's the power of the Spirit living through us and in us. And we will be back here one day together. But until then, we will continue to be the church because Jesus said we will, and we will do that indeed. The word will has another meaning. It talks about our resolve, our personal will. And we know what it means to say someone is willful. Sometimes we mean stubborn. But what if we were stubborn in our faith? What if we were the ones who said, we will do this in the name of Jesus Christ. We will go into the world. We will celebrate. We will praise we will serve, we will believe, we will stand in hope against all hopelessness, even in the midst of days like these. Just as in a marriage, it is easy sometimes to say, I do believe, I do believe when things are going our way. We are celebrating when a baby is born, we're celebrating when a marriage happens. But will we, when times are tough, if our children are ill, or if a marriage ends, or if a spouse dies, or when all the other troubles of life overtake us, or when a pandemic threatens the existence of people across God's entire world, will we then, will we celebrate and give God the glory? I believe, Epworth, that the answer is yes, yes, yes. Because just as in a marriage, Jesus Christ has come into our hearts he and the Father are one, and we are one in him, and we are one together, and nothing can stop us. I want to read you what comes next in John's Gospel. If we skip down a few verses, I'd like to read to you from verses 18 through 23. And these are, again, the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, they also will be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, 
so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So my question to you who are listening this morning, will you go into all the world? Will you go into your neighborhoods, even remotely right now? Will you go into your neighbor's home by a phone call that shows your caring and your love and your concern? Will you go when we're able to into places that you might not be so comfortable, into neighborhoods where the people don't look like you, into countries throughout the world where people have been called our enemies? Will you go to the places that you never thought you'd be and proclaim Christ and his glory and his truth? Will you go to the ends of the earth? We have folks serving Christ who are part of this congregation in Australia and Liberia. We have folks who travel back and forth to India. We have folks who travel back and forth just up and down York Road. Everywhere we go, we have the opportunity to share who Christ is. That is what gives him glory. Praising him is wonderful together here. Singing hymns. I miss hearing you all sing. I'm sure you're tired of hearing me squeak over here when I don't remember to bring a glass of water or a cough drop with me and I'm not used to singing at home right now. I can't wait until we can be together, but until then, we are the church, and yes, we will praise God and proclaim Jesus Christ. The ascension, it's a story that has importance for us today because Jesus didn't just leave us. He went to sit at the right hand of God, which means that through his spirit, he is everywhere, everywhere we are, everywhere we ever hope to be. He's there before us. He is there with us. He is there after us. He is there, and through him we are called to follow that path so that where he is, we will be one, so that where we are together, in isolation or in the building, we are still the church, we are still his body. So it's time to take our heads out of the clouds, and when he says, you will be filled with the Spirit to say, here I am, Lord, fill me. And when he says, you will be my witnesses to say, here I am, Lord, use me. Yes, we will. Amen. What is it that joins us together? Jesus said himself, I'm giving you a new commandment, that you love one another. This is how you will know, they will know that you are my disciples. So let us sing together, they will know we are Christians by our love. Will you please join me in our affirmation of faith as we read together the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now we turn to the time in our service where we share our joys and our concerns with one another. And once again, uh, it's, it's such a joy that we have um, a praying church, a church that truly cares about everyone and the things that are going on. Um, it's amazing to see the response when you make a request for prayer, how many people uh, jump in and let you know that they will be praying for you. It is such a blessing. The joys that we have to share this week, um, again, the gifts for the Margareta Griffith Scholarship, um, that has been amazing, and we thank you for that. That's another uh, sign of your incredible uh, love and generosity. We also lift up to you um, Kim Hall, our, one of our former pastors here at Epworth. Uh, she just graduated with her doctorate of ministry from Wesley Seminary. So joy for, for that wonderful accomplishment and for all that she is doing in ministry for the Lord. Um, this one is from our own Elaine Gradowski. Um, and she says, our little granddaughter Maggie was born not breathing and with no heartbeat. She was under two pounds. Miraculously, she revived herself. On Tuesday, Maggie will be a year old and is a lively and joyful 17 pounds and four ounces. Thank you for all your prayers. And that story has been a blessing to all of us. Um, we don't completely understand miracles and how they work, but we're thankful that they happen, and that truly was a miraculous uh, occasion, and it's been a joy to be able to follow her life over the past year and continue to pray for her and her family. Um, we also lift up Ann Rogers. Uh, she is home from the hospital, which is a joy. Um, the concern is she is under hospice care. Um, so uh, not a concern about hospice. Hospice is an amazing uh, and caring and loving ministry in and of itself. Uh, but the fact that she is in hospice care, uh, please continue to pray for her. Uh, concerns that we have from the congregation. Uh, prayers are being asked for Bob and Sylvia Schultz, uh, for Carrie Turner, and her mom. We also ask that you pray for Bob Kofiel, who is dealing with several health issues at this time. We ask prayers for Hannah Belgian, who is having a bad CRPS flare-up. Her pain uh, is uncontrollable. Uh, we ask for continued prayers for Carol Sullivan and her husband, Murray. His heart surgery was successful, but there have been several complications they are addressing. Carol is thankful for the progress that has been made and all the support that they've received. Thank you so much for the prayers that you have sent in. Please continue to share with us those things that you would like us to pray for. Um, that's all the prayers that I have for today. Holy God, when you ascended, you did not leave us alone. You did not leave us orphaned. Your spirit lives in us and through us, uniting us with you and with the Father, uniting us with one another in love that binds us together and strengthens and empowers us to work in the world. So send us where you would have us go. Fill us with the spirit and use us as you will, that we might glorify you by revealing who you are through acts of loving kindness, 
through our proclamation, both in word, but especially in deed and in action and in heart. For those concerns that we raised, we know that they were in your love and care before we knew that there were issues to pray about. But you call us to pray for one another, to lift one another up in the fellowship and before you. And so we bring them to you. You know their needs. You know the places in their lives that cry out for healing and wholeness. We know that you alone are able to bring healing and hope and peace to them, but that you ask us to be vessels of your love and grace and mercy and peace. So strengthen us to reach out to them. For the joys that we experienced and gave thanks to you for, we praise you for lives that were spared, for lives that amaze us, for the joy that we have in each other, for the generosity of this congregation. And we ask that you would bless the gifts that are sent into this church through electronic means or through the U.S. Postal Service. However they come to us, we offer them to you to be signs of your glory and your work among your people. Lord, we humble ourselves before you because we don't consider ourselves worthy to be bearers of your message. And yet you have called us and equipped us and you have sent us. So be with us on our journey. Remind us of the hope that is ours. We pray for those who are working on the front lines of this pandemic. We pray that you might help those who are looking for a vaccine. We pray that you might help those researchers looking for new medications that might help to treat these people. We pray for those who are putting themselves at risk every day going to work in hospitals and medical facilities, as well as those who are delivering packages and stocking shelves. We know that their sacrifice has been great, and we pray your protection on them and on us. For all that we have been blessed with, for all that we are entrusted with, for all that you have sent us to do, we thank you and we praise you in the name of Christ our Savior, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, Our Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come. thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn comes from Worship and Song, number 3087. O Christ, when you ascended, please join us in singing.
was called to be a shepherd and not a televangelist. And up here sometimes with the lights in our eyes and everything else, I don't even see what I have written down in front of me. I would be remiss if I didn't remind us that this week we recognize in our nation Memorial Day. It's not Armed Forces Day. It's not Veterans Day. It is a day that we set aside to remember those who sacrificed their ultimate for the sake of our country. There is no one listening to me right now who did not know someone who died in a war or sometimes in several wars. I always think of my great aunt Daisy when this day comes around, who buried one of her sons after World War II and lost another during the Korean conflict just a few short years later. We have all been touched by their sacrifice, and we need to remember and thank God for those who are willing to give of themselves, especially since we're calling this pandemic a war. The enemy is not of flesh in the sense that it's another person or another nation or another belief. It's a virus that is apolitical and amoral and that will strike at whoever it can. So on this weekend, when we remember those who have sacrificed so much, remember to give thanks. When Jesus gathered his disciples together before he ascended, they didn't get it. They said, is this the time, Lord, when you're going to restore your kingdom? I'm sure that Jesus just wanted to sigh and say, are you still so clueless? My kingdom is not of this world. It is not temporal. My kingdom is eternal. My kingdom and my reign will know no end, and you will witness to that because you will be empowered to do that. We know that he kept his word because the Spirit was poured out upon them at Pentecost, and they went forward. Most of them would not live to see another day because they were all, as far as we know, martyred in the faith. The same disciples who the night before he died, ran into the night and hid, would go willingly to their deaths, proclaiming who he was. But before they died, they inspired other disciples filled with the Holy Spirit. And they reached Timonium and Cockeysville and Hereford and this end of the earth and all ends of the earth because they accepted the power from on high. So go into the world accepting the power and knowing that Christ has called you and that you can, and that you are able, and that you should, and I hope you will witness to his power, to his majesty. That is what gives him glory. That is what makes him known. And the blessings of God Almighty, who is Father, who is Son, who is Holy Spirit, will be with you now and always. Amen.